A carriage is a spoked wheel vehicle, usually pulled by horses for transporting goods and people. When only two wheels are used, it is generally referred to as a cart, while four wheel unsprung devices are normally called wagons. An enclosed passenger vehicle is routinely identified as a coach, although a simpler covered or uncovered two-seater was generally called a buggy. The one thing in common to all early carriages was a wooden spoke wheel held securely together by an iron metal rim called a tire and originally spelled T-Y-R-E. Our Harvey County story begins about 1612 with the cultivation of tobacco in Jamestown, Virginia. The export of tobacco to Great Britain was a financial bonanza for early colonists who used the money to purchase manufactured English goods. Maryland was established at St. Mary's in 1634, whereupon by 1660, intrepid colonists had ventured up the Chesapeake Bay, obtaining grants on waterfront parcels of land in what is now present-day Harford County's Gunpowder Neck and Bush River Neck. To facilitate tobacco production, it's most likely that oxen-driven carts, like the ones found in Jamestown, were used for farm haulage, while tobacco was transported to a loading dock over a rolling road in a cylindrical container known as a hogshead. Initially, the spoke wheels needed for a cart or carriage were imported, as in Maryland it was not until 1652 that the first wheelwright, Edward Philpot, has been identified. This circular fabrication required the specialized skills of an individual who could produce the hub, the spokes, and fellows, and then assemble the pieces into a wooden wheel, whereupon a blacksmith would install an encompassing iron tire. Now, with the help of a blacksmith to produce an axle and a few other iron parts, a carpenter or other craftsman could then construct a cart or wagon. And as more settlers continued to move inland, this migration gradually developed rudimentary paths of wagon roads. Over time, American wheelwrights were actually able to produce a spoked wheel that was superior to their English counterpart as a result of using a better local material. Hickory trees, not found in the British Isles, were plentiful in Harford County and yielded a more resilient spoke as a result of the wood's strength and its ability to bend but not break. Attesting to the proliferation of this indigenous tree is today's village named Hickory, and the fact that thousands of wooden hickory spokes were shipped out of the Joel Hollingsworth Spoke Factory in Wilna on the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad to East Coast wheel manufactories. Before identifying a succession of Harford County carriage manufacturers, it's worthwhile to first examine some early history to place their efforts in perspective. A rudimentary cart, originating about 300 AD, found use in China for transporting supplies along a pathway not wide enough for a two-wheeled device. In some cases, it was a wooden box over a large center-mounted wheel that was hand-pushed by two handles, sometimes aided by a small sail. In Europe and in America, it would transition into a wheelbarrow with a front-mounted wheel that required both lifting and pushing to move. Many two-wheeled animal-powered carts were made for moving agricultural products, and some devices featured a variation that allowed for easy dumping of the vehicle's contents. As well, fire companies used hand-pulled carts to transport water hoses to the fire site, such as one found in the Bel Air Volunteer Fire Company on Hickory Avenue. In some cases, a horse-drawn cart was designed exclusively to transport a passenger, such as the cabriolet that was fashionable in the early years of Queen Victoria's reign. The Brougham carriage, named in honor of Lord Brougham of England, was a compact, low-hung, one-horse vehicle. It featured an enclosed two-passenger compartment with glass windows and was driven by an open front-mounted operator. A third passenger could also be accommodated on the forward seat. It became popular in America as a gentleman's carriage. The buckboard was a very basic carriage utilizing a springy wooded floor, such as one made of ash directly mounted on the axles. It was probably developed during the first third of the 19th century, and this early model did not have a dashboard. The seat was mounted towards the center between the wheels, and in some cases could accommodate two or three passengers. 
If the word buckboard has a familiar ring to old timers, it's likely the result of a song written by Jay Livingston and Ray Evans in 1947 titled Buttons and Bows. Tennessee songstress Dinah Shore noted, My bones denounce the buckboard's bounce and the cactus hurts my toes, but I'm all yours in buttons and bows. The name buggy originated in England to describe a one-seater carriage, but in America it became the most popular two-seater utility and pleasure wagon ever built. By about 1900, mass production had allowed Sears and Roebuck in their catalog to advertise its cost at $34.95. It had a piano box body with room in the boot to carry purchases, a fold-down top over a cushioned seat, and with elliptic springs provided a relatively smooth ride. It became a favorite courting vehicle, as highlighted by this limerick. With sweet Miss Susie at my side, and a fine buggy, we went for a ride. Along a quiet lane with no real shame, our lips together, slowly did glide. Some courting couples preferred to be more anonymous and used the enclosed structure of a covered bridge for concealment. This shadowy, romantic approach, however, did sometimes have a slight drawback, as occasionally mischievous youngsters would hide on the cross ties below the rafters of a covered bridge to witness a kiss they would later understand. The cabriolet was initially best known as a two-wheeled vehicle that was popular in France as a street hack for hire. It found its way to England, where a coach builder converted the basic design to what he called a four-wheeled cabriolet phaeton. After the carriage was introduced to America, phaeton was dropped, becoming known only as a cabriolet. The Dayton was a wagon with springs that usually had two or more removable seats and was generally adorned with a top. As the seats could be taken out, it could be used for hauling farm produce and later reconfigured as a family carriage. Thus, it was a very practical conveyance in agricultural Harford County. In 1870, transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson cynically noted that individuals aspiring to idealistic aspirations were hitching their wagon to a star. Today, a more realistic interpretation of the phrase would be attaching yourself to someone you admire who has achieved some success. Thus, we have the limerick, It has been said, if you want to go far, regardless of birth or whomever you are, you must have a dream of peaches and cream and then hitch your wagon to a star. We also learn that singer Bunny Hill and friends reminded us to hitch your wagon to a star and ride right up to the moon. The Phaeton is an attractive carriage that takes its name from Phaeton, son of Helios in Greek mythology, who drove the chariot of the sun with such recklessness that Zeus struck him down with a thunderbolt, lest he set the earth on fire. A Phaeton was owner-driven and remained popular until the end of the carriage era. Few had an enclosure with doors, and due to many stylistic variations, it sometimes looked like other vehicles with different names. The Rockaway had an enclosed passenger body with the driver's seat covered by an overhead roof. It's a distinctively American style that emanated from Jamaica, Long Island. But the New York City carriage dealer who sold them deceived buyers, saying they were from Rockaway Beach, New York. Even after the truth was known, the name stuck. In 1850, Henry Woolsey offered Harford Countyans the Rockaway Carriage, thus providing an opportunity to introduce this limerick. Rock me mama like a wagon wheel, keep me moving to the Virginia reel. I want a nap right in your lap, but wake me up for my next meal. Singer and songwriter Darius Rucker also suggested rock me mama like the wind in the rain. Rock me like a southbound train. Oh, mama, rock me. The Stanhope was originally a two-wheeled vehicle designed by Fitzroy Stanhope that provided comfort for both the passenger and the horse, but was later redesigned with four wheels. It became a gentleman's vehicle, drawn by one or occasionally two horses in tandem. The Stanhope was popular in both England and in America. 
The Surrey was an American four-wheeled family carriage that became very popular by the mid-1880s. Many different styles and variations developed, such as the fringe around the top, and it remained in use until the end of the carriage era. Of all the carriages in America, this is one of the best remembered as a result of the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Oklahoma and the song Surrey with the Fringe on Top. Performer Gordon McRae reminds us of this carriage with the lyrics, Chicks and ducks and geese better scurry when I take you out in the Surrey. When I take you out in the Surrey with the fringe on top. The Victoria carriage was considered a statelier design than the Cambriolet, as it had a curving dash in front of a single cushion seat and was adaptable for use by one or two horses. Often driven in a park setting, it was popular with the English and American aristocracy, but probably found little use in rural Harford County. Now we learn a little bit about those couplets in life with this limerick. Some things in life come in pairs, like having his and her chairs. A pair of bookends becoming best friends, and couples when having affairs. We often associate things together, such as bacon and eggs, salt and pepper, bread and butter. And when it comes to transportation, it was the horse and carriage. Singer Frank Sinatra reminds us that this is also paired with a long-lasting romance, singing love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and carriage. This, I tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other. It wouldn't be until 1803 when John Don of Havre de Grace is identified as Harford County's first coachmaker. It's likely he produced wagons with a top covering, which continued until about 1828, when he was unfortunately imprisoned for debt. His sons, John M. Don and Thomas C. Don, both born about 1804, however carried on the business, now re-identified as a carriage manufactory. The two appeared in the 1831 tax list as individuals, but not as a company, and they later relocated out of the area, making this Havre de Grace business relatively short-lived. By 1800, the village of Abingdon at Bush, along Old Post Road, now Maryland Route 7, contained about 56 dwellings with about 240 inhabitants. It had a tavern, grist mill, church, about eight stores, a tan yard, several trade shops, and a newspaper. It's known that by 1830, John G. Hill operated one of the shops that provided repairs to carriages. The Old Post Road was an important north-south travel route, and Craftsman Hill was ideally located. It seems appropriate to recognize these tenacious craftsmen with a limerick. The brawny, hard-working wheelwright fashioned the parts with all of his might. The spokes, the fellies, and hub had to fit like a bug in a rug, then secured by a tire that held them tight. Henry Woolsey Jr. was a farmer, a wheelwright, and possibly a blacksmith, who by 1858 operated the Woolsey Carriage Shops near Churchville. He employed two craftsmen and advertised that his shops were prepared to furnish to order carriages, wagons, and harness. He emphasized that the business supplied everything needed pertaining to carriages and that second-hand vehicles were also available. Another newspaper ad mentioned he was prepared to deliver rockaways, buggies, express and hearse wagons, as well as carts. In 1860, Philip R. Spicer advertised in the National American newspaper that he had moved into larger and more convenient facilities and was prepared to make all kinds of carriages to order. He was located in Pleasantville, Harford County, and had acquired the rights of J.B. Hayden's patent for wheels. As well, he would accept a second-hand carriage at a fair price as partial payment for a new one. In 1866, John and William Finney Hanna announced they had constructed in Bel Air two extensive buildings for the manufacture of woodwork, painting, and the finishing of carriages. One simple advertisement featured a single carriage, while another ad was a poetical reading. If your carriage will no longer stand and you wish to get another, just call around with cash in hand on John Hanna and his brother. The owners were always thinking outside of the carriage body box. 
offering a way to open and close a farm or residential gate by way of ropes and pulleys, while the driver remained seated in his vehicle. Additionally, for carriages needing repairs or painting, they would do the work during the winter, then safely store it until the owner called in the spring. In 1871, John A. Hanna was awarded a patent for an improvement in a carriage seat joint that allowed a seat back to be folded down out of the way. This improvement was advertised as a jump seat, a name that caught on and was used to promote the sale of their vehicles. Sometime prior to 1866, Joshua Gorell and Frederick Hinson had operated a blacksmithing and carriage-making operation in the village of Darlington. But as of this date, their partnership was dissolved. Four years later, however, Gorell reopened the Darlington shop, advertising he was prepared to take orders for all kinds of carriages and buggies in the latest patterns and styles. He apparently produced more vehicles than he could sell, prompting an Aegis and Intelligencer ad offering low prices for buyers who were willing to pay cash. Sometime later, not being able to do all the work himself, Gorell took on a partner, Henry Ellsworth Self, and renamed the business the Darlington Carriage and Wagon Works. In 1892, this second partnership was also dissolved, and Gorell continued the operation until his death in 1916. In 1872, James H. Harkins advertised his carriage-making and repair facility near the village of Hickory, offering discounts for those paying with cash. Five years later, in 1877, he had relocated to Churchville, now identifying this community as his permanent location. An advertisement in 1890 touted his operation as the old reliable, and it's learned he was employing others in support of his carriage trade. He later decided to move to Aberdeen, and his facilities were underway there by May 1891 under the banner of Aberdeen Carriage Works. At the Harford County Fair in the 1880s, he exhibited a number of carriages that were noted by the local press. M. F. Hopkins in 1874 announced he had opened a carriage and wagon manufactory in Churchville, where he also repaired vehicles as well as agricultural implements. According to a January 1876 newspaper ad, he produced buggies, jaggers, jump seat carriages, wagons, dog carts, and phaetons. By the following March, he had a new partner, whereupon Hopkins and Barnes were selling their carriage inventory at bargain prices, not raising enough capital, however. On Saturday, June 7, 1876, the assets were auctioned off. John T. Alexander announced in the newspaper on March 6, 1874, that he had recently erected his empire shops in Heaven of Grace, and later advertised he was prepared to do blacksmithing and wheelwriting work, as well as make wagons and carriages. In 1880, he built a hook and ladder carriage for the city that added greatly to the municipality's firefighting capability. A buggy he made for John L. Cook was described by the newspaper as some neat and tasty work. Joel Hollingsworth was previously mentioned as a manufacturer of hickory spokes for wheels, which began production in 1862 under the banner of the Willow Valley Spokes Works. By 1876, however, he started the construction of a wheel factory along the banks of Winter's Run, thus over time providing the name for the facility's access road. It had been known since the creation of the first spoked wheel that the weakest part was the hub, and various entrepreneurs such as Sarvin and Warner had patented improvements. Hollingsworth went further, developing and patenting a better hub using a hybrid combination of iron and wood that, in addition to its strength, was more aesthetically pleasing. A Bel Air-based carriage manufacturer utilized his wheels for their vehicles, and his three-story facility remained in operation until a fire in 1898. Trained as a blacksmith and wheelwright, by 1877, James E. Eli was operating in Forest Hill, promoting his carriage, spring wagon, buggy, and horseshoeing businesses. Eli's facility is one of the few old carriage factories where a photograph still exists. After passing away in 1927, he was buried in the cemetery of the Center Methodist Church. 
In 1877, wheelwright Conrad Frick was operating in the area of Henry Records Mills along the Little Gunpowder River near the Baltimore County line. Seeking to expand his business, he rented a shop in Bel Air, formerly occupied by Jesse DeHaven. He advertised on April 6, 1877, in the Aegis and Intelligencer that he was prepared to make farm wagons, carriages, buggies, and also do repair work. Unfortunately, he died three years later at the early age of 32 and was buried at the Fork Methodist Church Cemetery. On April 16, 1875, J.J.M. Alexander advertised in the Aegis and Intelligencer that he was a blacksmith and horseshoer who also made to order carriages and wagons. By May 12, 1882, however, his Bel Air operation was primarily focusing on carriage and wagon fabrication, along with the repair of these types of vehicles. This transition to manufacturing must have been successful, as later in the year he ran an advertisement claiming to be the leading carriage manufactory doing good work and selling at low prices. It's possible that Alexander could have bragged like the proprietor in this limerick. We make fine carriages and that's a big deal. The bodies are painted and the leather is real. In this capable shop, the work doesn't stop and I'm the boss who is called the big wheel. The year 1882 must have appeared prosperous for vehicle manufacturing, as John Smith opened a new shop in Bel Air, advertising he was prepared to deliver fine family carriages, buggies, and wagons. Shortly after getting underway, however, lightning struck his building, doing some minor damage, but the carriages inside were unharmed. In 1891, Smith promoted his products at the Harford County Fair, and his business continued to grow, as evidenced by an 1888 advertisement in the Harford Democrat that touted doing more business than ever. He would later build a butcher's wagon for Joseph A. Cole, who is shown under a protective platform making a delivery to Liriodendron. As early as 1887, Smith had expanded his business into a dealership, becoming an agent for the Brown Farm Wagon. While wagons were most often associated with farming, some found an industrial use in quarrying, as illustrated by this limerick. A gravel-filled wagon driven by Ramon kept moving on with a creak and a groan. Oh, wagon master, can you go faster? Not on your life when I'm rolling stone. In 1888, W.S. Bulett, formerly of Delta, Pennsylvania, formed a stock company that had established a large carriage and wagon facility on three-quarter acres of land off of Thomas Street in Bel Air. One year later, it was operating with 18 individuals that quickly grew to 40 employees who were working on hundreds of vehicles in various stages of construction. It seems most appropriate that the first production model was acquired by R. Charles Lee of Jerusalem, Harford County, with others being shipped out by rail to more distant markets. One vehicle, a number 10 full leather buggy, was sold to J.M. Hardy and Son of Staunton, Virginia, as evidence of a surviving invoice. A fire in September 1891 destroyed the facility, and Bulett returned to Delta to continue his downsized carriage business. For a good carriage with no concerns, and have any grace one quickly learns. Those in the know are sure to go to the fine business of Brothers Burns. Under the organization of Walter Ellsworth Burns, this Havre Grace carriage business was established in March 1890. The 25-year-old Burns took possession of Alexander's Empire Carriage Shops near the Canal Basin and advertised carriage repaired. However, by year's end, he was producing and advertising the Burns Park Cart, featuring a testimony from Dr. Smith that it rides with as little fatigue as the doctor's personal phaeton. By the following year, in 1891, he was offering a free two-week trial of his cart to interested buyers. He continued to expand his product line, entering several vehicles in the Harford County Fair in Bel Air. 
By early 1895, the company had moved into a new factory on Green Street, which was four stories high, 38 by 70 feet, with a large glass-fronted first-floor showroom. Also, the business had been joined by three of his brothers, Jonathan Isaac, Reese Norris, and Alfred Grant Burns. A fourth brother, Charles Brittingham Burns, was only 16 years old at the time and would join the company later. Tragedy struck in 1902 when a fire destroyed their facility that was rebuilt one year later and called Burns Brothers. It was touted as the largest and best equipped carriage factory in the East. With the automobile speeding into the spotlight, by 1909, the carriage business was declining, so the company introduced the Burns Physician's Car that was exhibited at the Baltimore Automobile Show held in the 5th Regiment Armory. In 1912, after a number of years with dismal prospects, they introduced the Overland Automobile, followed by the Maxwell in 1916. But these sales were also disappointing. Therefore, in 1918, their factory was converted into apartments, ending almost three decades of operation. A portion of their legacy can still be seen today as exhibited by a magnificent hose cart in the Community Fire Company of Perryville, Maryland, and a Stanhope trap found in the Nutter D. Marvel Carriage Museum in Georgetown, Delaware. The symbiotic relation between the equine population and their adoring feathered friends, particularly the sparrow, still exists today, although on a much smaller scale. The horse's diet of hay and grass contained many seeds that were not digested, hence passed through into the animal's excrement, and subsequently were pecked out of the remains by flocks of hungry sparrows. Reminding us of this time, Annette Hanshaw belted out, Happy days are here again, the sky above is blue again. While we sing a song of cheer again, happy days are here again. There is a little known and perhaps fabricated story about country songwriter and recording artist Kenny Rogers, who at one time owned a small farm. It was a rather old and rustic place where one day he was poking around in one of the deserted barns and discovered an antique buggy that he hitched to a horse and drove his family and friends around the farm. Later, he decided to drive the buggy into a nearby small town where it was an immediate attraction. He was hurrying back to his farm to get ready for a concert that evening when the right front wheel rolled off into a ditch. Worried about being late for the engagement, he disgustedly uttered, you picked a fine time to leave me, loose wheel. As Paul Harvey might have said, now you know the rest of the story of You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. When a Harford County farmer had five-gallon cans of milk to deliver to a stop on the Ma and Pa, he loaded them in his wagon and headed for the rail line. Likewise, when he needed grain ground into animal feed, his wagon transported it to the gristmill. If a malfunction developed in the harness, he could most likely make a repair. But if a wagon wheel broke, he became stranded. So it's likely he wanted the wheels to keep on turning so as to carry him home. This sentiment was also expressed by the Sons of the Pioneers. The scriptwriter's father was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina in 1905. He was the only male sibling in his family of six older and one younger sister. As time goes by, his older sisters passed away, and a celebration of their lives was convened in Rocky Mount. A specially baked cake of an eight-spoked wagon wheel was prepared with a missing spoke for the deceased. This family tradition continued until all of the spokes had been removed by time's effacing fingers. Here lies the parts of a wagon wheel that used to turn with spirit and zeal. But with a snap, it went to crap, like the remains of a digested meal. <laughs>